Hello students at Dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and in today's lecture we're going to take a look at oblique impact. Okay, so oblique impact fundamentally is two-dimensional impact. We talked about one-dimensional impact, which can also be called direct central impact. Um, so we're going to pick up a second dimension. We're going to see a lot of the same equations today than we saw in the previous video. Okay, so we are going to have two-dimensional. We're going to call our horizontal axes T. In words, we're going to call this the line of contact. Okay, so if you have a single particle and you're bouncing it off a surface, the surface you're bouncing it off of is the line of contact. I think of this letter T here like being the table. Okay, and then we use a second dimension, which is perpendicular to that. Now, some books use X and Y, some books use tangent normal, T and N, actually using like using the T and N format. And so this N direction, we call this the line of impact. So if you recall, I'm going to erase this highlighting here in just a second, but if you recall from direct central impact, all of that impact was along this N line. So it's really the T that we're adding in. Everything else we learned about the N still holds true. Okay. So if we have a particle up here, this is particle A, here's particle B, and they're going to collide right here at the center of our axis system across this line of contact and then they're going to bounce off of each other so we could show that their initial velocity coming in we could call this vb1 va1 and then after they bounce va2 vb2 okay now, I'm going to do something here, sorry to change my drawing just a little bit, but just to emphasize that these impact equations do not handle any motion that isn't directly, immediately before contact and post-contact. Okay, so it's not going to handle any project projectile motion. It's not going to handle any kind of acceleration that isn't directly related to the impact of the two particles. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you're looking at these equations, that all the velocities in every single impact equation is immediately before and immediately after. And so what we see in this, in this setup, and we talked about that our direct central impact was analogous um, to what's going on here in the n direction, right? So in this n direction is where a coefficient of restitution is going to be applied. So we'll put E applied. And you'll probably remember from projectile motion, if we neglect air resistance, which of course in this case we're talking about that these velocities are immediately before impact and immediately after. You're not going to have any air resistance happening in there anyways. And so basically in this T direction, we're going to have a conservation of momentum for each particle. Basically what that means is that the masses don't change. You're going to have the same velocity coming in. Okay, if I break this VB1 into components, we could say that VB1 sub T, and over here VB2 sub T, that these are going to be equal. Okay, so a conservation of momentum for each particle in that t direction. So this is going to be the exact same equations that we used on the previous page of notes. The only difference will be is that these will be essentially components of the velocity in the t and n versus the full velocity. Okay, so first of all we can say that in the n direction, And once again, these are the same two equations. I'm going to number them the same here with these red boxes. So we have conservation of momentum. And so this tells me that MAVA1N, this is a vector, plus MB, 
V, B, 1, N. Okay, the normal, the vertical component in this case is equal to M, A, V, A, 2 sub N. So the final vertical component of the momentum plus M, B, V, B, 2 sub N. Okay, so these are the velocities basically vertical to the page. Once again, same relationship. And another way we could say this is that we have a conservation of system momentum in the end direction. Okay, let me put that here. I'll write that right below. So we say this, this means a conservation of system momentum in the n direction. All right, we also know that our coefficient of restitution applies in the n direction. Okay, so equation number two, coefficient of restitution tells us E is a ratio of departure to approach velocities. Okay, and once again, these are gonna be sub n's. V, B two sub n minus V, a2 sub n, so our final velocity is on the top, that's the sub 2, and then v a1 sub n minus v b1 sub n. Okay, so this tells us that our coefficient of restitution only applies perpendicular to our line of contact, which pushes it into the line of impact. And so those are our relationships in the n direction. And then in the t direction, We said fundamentally the T components of the velocity are going to be maintained. Okay, so what we can do with those is we can write that MA VA1 sub T is equal to MA VA2 sub T. And of course, if you're not losing any velocities, or excuse me, you're not losing any mass. Fundamentally, VA1 sub T is equal to VA2 sub T. And we find the same thing for B. VB1 sub T is equal to VB2 sub T. So I'll put these, both of these equations out here, both if you change masses and not change masses. So, sorry, the second one's for B. VB1 sub T. T is equal to M B V B two sub T. Okay, so this would be for no delta M, no change in mass, and these over here could handle a change in mass. Okay, so once again, what this tells us is we have a conservation of momentum for each particle, and I wrote that up above right here. Conservation of momentum for each particle. So three equations, and as you think about using these three equations, once again, you can get by with just the top two equations on a 1D problem. Okay, so uh, let's go with the simplest here. This is going to be for 1D when E is equal to zero. Okay, you've got sticking together either pre or post. Um, after your motion. You're going to need two equations with two unknowns in a 1D problem when your E is greater than zero. And then three equations with three unknowns in a 2D problem when E is greater than zero. And there may be some other odd combinations, but this gives you at least some flow to think about when you need each one of these equations. All right, in this oblique impact example, we're going to combine elements of projectile motion. Actually, we're going to use some work energy, some conservation of energy, since it will be a non-work relationship. In addition to the conservation of momentum, the coefficient of restitution, okay, so a number of different equations coming together. And so the scenario we have, draw this slope here a little steeper than a 45 degree angle, okay? Because it is proportional to a four vertical, three horizontal, okay? So a three, four, five right triangle. 
And so we are dropping a mass, which has a mass of five kilograms. We're gonna drop that and it's going to bounce off of this surface. And we wanna find fundamentally the post bounce velocity V two. Okay, so what I'm using here is I'm going to call this up here one. So one is at rest. So the mass is not moving. We're going to have a V1 coming into the surface and then a V2, which is going to be based upon a coefficient of restitution E is equal to 0 0.75. So our problem statement would say that we have a 0 0.5 kilogram mass is dropped one meter onto a surface with E is equal to 0 0.75. We want to know what is the velocity expressed What is the post bounce velocity expressed in TN coordinates? Okay, so we have two different axis systems going here. One axis system will use a standard x, y axis system. So y is going up, x is going to go over to the right. I'm not quite sure where v2 is going to end up. If, if v2 is going to be above horizontal or below horizontal, um, we could figure that out as we move forward. I do know that my normal axis here is perpendicular to the surface. And my t axis, like I said, analogous to a table that you're bouncing something off of, is there along that surface. Okay, so um, we have an initial, and actually I'm going to rename this initial instead of calling it one, let me call it zero. Okay, so I have zero, one, and two for my at rest, my pre bounce, and my post bounce. And I'll keep those going as I work through the equations. And so there's multiple ways we could figure out what the velocity is at one. I think the easiest one probably is work energy. And so we could write this out that mgh zero plus one half mv zero squared is equal to mgh one plus one half mv one squared. So really this is taking a look at our conservation of energy without springs. And so I left out the spring terms. I do need to add in a datum. Okay, so we're gonna call this our datum. And we're gonna measure positive h going up from that datum. And we said that it's dropped one meter Okay, so my H1 is zero, my V naught is zero, because it is at rest, and so basically I'm converting height into velocity. And another thing we can notice here is that both sides have a mass in them, so we can go ahead and cancel that mass, becomes a mass independent relationship. And so what we have left is that V So what we can compute is that we have V1 equal to, ends up being the square root of two times gravity times the one meter. And so V1 is equal to 4.429, it's meters per second. We can convert that over into our axis system. We could say that V1 in our XY coordinates as a vector, it's gonna have 100% of the velocity in the negative y direction, right? Zero comma negative 4.29, it's in meters per second. Okay, so that does fine for us if we're gonna stick in the xy, but we need to push things into the tn, 
in order to be able to apply our coefficient of restitution. A reminder that the coefficient of restitution will only apply in this n direction. Everything in the t direction will actually be conserved. Okay, so once you figure out those components in the t direction. So as we look at this problem, notice here we had this three, four, five right triangle. Okay, I'm just going to simplify that saying that if you wanted to, you could find the inverse tangent of theta being four thirds. Right? You could compute that angle theta. Now we also know we have this relationship between perpendicular lines. And so here I have a straight line. Here I have this normal axis perpendicular to it. And so if I have this angle theta from horizontal, I know I have the same angle theta here from vertical. Now, if I want to additionally express things related to the 3, 4, 5, I need to turn this V1 into a triangle as related to the 3, 4, 5. Okay, I'm going to extend it up here just a little bit, give myself a little bit more length. And so essentially breaking that into components, here is a component in the T and another component here in the N, okay? Creating that as a right triangle. And if that's my theta, theta is adjacent to the three side of the triangle. It's opposite the four side of the triangle. And the hypotenuse here is the five side of the triangle, okay? So I could continue to use my three, four, five if I wanted to, or I could use sines and cosines. It's kind of up to you. But what I've done here is I've transferred this angle theta, this horizontal angle, up here into a right triangle, created a right triangle because I wanted a hypotenuse to take V1, convert it into tangent and normal, into these T and N coordinates, so I could feed it into my impact equations. Okay, so let me just put a couple notes here so we can see that the T term, so V1T is going to equal four fifths of V1, and then off this part here, this is going to be the negative N direction, so V1N is equal negative three fifths of V1. Okay, and once again, I pulled the positive and negative signs just from my axis system because the T term here is going in a positive T direction, the N term is going in a negative N direction as defined by my axes. All right, so coming back over to my full page of computations. So here, as a little side note, we are going to convert V1 vector into T and components. And so we have that V1 as a vector. I'm going to go with my T and N. So my value was 4.429 for V1. So that times 4 fifths for my T component. And then my N component, we have a negative 4.429 times 3 fifths. Once again, could use sines and cosines. In this case, if you're using that same angle theta, the three-fifths would be the cosine, the four-fifths would be the sine. So we are getting close, because now we have V1 expressed in T and N components. Numerically, these are equal to 3.5436 and a negative 2.6577. All right, keep in mind that we talked about that the T component is going to be maintained. Okay, so this is basically the velocity that's parallel to the surface. That will not change. The only one that will change is this one in the N direction. So just highlighting here, this is the T component, this is the N component. And so it's to this N1, we're going to apply the coefficient of restitution. Basically, it will be reduced by the coefficient of restitution and flipped directions. Okay, so let me just put that underneath here. So E is equal to um, V, so your negative V, 
a to n divided by v a one n putting in my known values 0 0.75 we don't know the final yet so that's our unknown and we know the initial was a negative 2.6577 sorry to squeeze that in there but the same value we had up here so we can find that v a to n flip the sign right basically cancel these double negatives here and here multiplying 2.6577 by 0.75 we end up with a final loss in that direction of 1.993 meters per second so our v2 vector in tangent and normal same value in the t 3.5436 and positive 1.993 post bounce. Now, if you needed to take this problem even further and fundamentally figure out how far it bounced down slope, um, then quite honestly, I would take this velocity, I turn it back into xy. And you want to turn it back into xy so that you have all your acceleration in the y direction. Now, alternately, you could split your acceleration in the y direction into a tangent component and a normal component. You end up getting the same answer, but it's, like I said, kind of up to you. But turning this back into xy, we'd basically go back through this process here in the opposite direction to get things back into x and y space. Um, and to be honest with you, I think I probably would do this as as uh, separate steps okay so let me just actually edit this here to say turn your tangent component into x y turn your normal component into x and y and then add together your x's and add together your y's i think that's the easiest way to work through um, the various triangles um, but that does complete this problem as specified, finding our post bounce velocity in T and N components, highlighting here that only our um, normal, only our perpendicular to the surface velocities were affected by the coefficient of restitution. After we had the bounce, even you know, pre to post, the velocity along the surface in the T direction was conserved. Hope this helps your understanding of this topic and hope you're having a great day.